celebrate the life of Ruth Brewer of Cavendish, who passed away peacefully in December at age 96. Ruth's love for and dedication to her community was an inspiration to everyone who knew her. For many years, Ruth was a counselor at Cavendish Resort Municipality and was a driving force in the growth and success of one of PEI's most famous destinations. Well known for her work with children, she was a specialist in early childhood education, particularly with preschool children and those with special needs. Ruth, a trailblazer and champion for nurse practitioners and rural health clinics on PEI, was responsible for the establishment of the North Rustico Clinic. Ruth actually lived in the North Rustico Lighthouse in the 60s and 70s, where she researched and wrote a book on the history of the harbour. We salute you, Ruth. Your community, indeed all of Canada, are a better place thanks to your life's work. Rest in peace. The Honourable Member for South Surrey, White Rock. Madam Speaker, I rise to speak for the first time in the 30, 43rd Parliament and as the member for the wonderful riding of South Surrey, White Rock. I thank my husband Brent, my four children, so many amazing volunteers, who, and the citizens, of course, of my riding who have placed their trust in me to represent them here in Ottawa. Ours is a vibrant coastal community in southwest BC, home to Semiamu First Nation, but it's also the home to the Equitas Society that supports injured Canadian soldiers suffering lifelong disabilities, seeking equity and fairness from the Canadian government and a path forward back to civilian life after service. The Society sponsors the Canadian Walk for Veterans to be held nationwide this year on September 26 to engage, inspire and thank our veteran community. I'll be joining in and I urge all Canadians to also register and show their gratitude. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Hey. The Honourable Member for Don Valley East. Madam Speaker, the week of February, designated by the UN General Assembly as the World Interfaith Harmony Week, WIHW, is celebrating its 10th year. The City of Toronto has proclaimed the week of February 1st to 7th as WIHW Week. The theme for 2020 is Harmony in Diversity. This is a very appropriate topic in today's world where through misunderstanding there is anger and hatred against the other. I would like to thank the Chair of the Toronto WIHW, John Vopossel, for his leadership in gathering people of all faiths through dialogue, music, culture and art to show the world that peace and harmony can exist, irrespective of faith, culture or creed. I was fortunate to attend the St. Patrick Lutheran Church this Sunday and present a certificate to Mr. Chandakana for his contribution to interfaith dialogue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Salam and peace to all. Well done. The Honourable Member for Laurentie de la Belle. Madam Speaker, like every February, we are celebrating Black History Month. Throughout this month, we will speak in the House to showcase famous Black Quebecers. The theme is Here and Now. The words we want to highlight should showcase our black fellow countrymen. We want fair and equitable treatment in all areas of life and society. We are also calling for better representation of black communities in the media and politics as spokesperson for living together in the Bloc Québécois. I would particularly like to salute my colleagues from these communities. They are models for the youth of their communities and to have uh, inspiration for better representation here in our democratic institution. Dorval. The Honourable Member for Dorval, La Chine, La Salle. Mr. Speaker, on January 6th, on behalf of the Minister of Transport, I had the privilege of attending the presentation of the gold-headed cane to Captain Xin Zhao Fei, master of the Exeborg, the first ocean-going vessel to reach the Port of Montreal without a stopover in 2020. The Port of Montreal is the second largest port in Canada and a substantial economic driver for my riding, Montreal, the province of Quebec, and the rest of Canada. 
That's why our government has invested in a number of projects at the Port of Montreal, which will boost its productivity. For the first time in its history, the Port of Montreal has surpassed the 40 million ton mark for cargo handled. I'd also like to thank the CEO of the Port of Montreal, Sylvie Vachon, as well as her team and the Corporation of Mid-St. Lawrence Pilots for their hard work guiding ships safely to port. Thank you very much. For Abbotsford. Canadians are generous people. Recently, for the 16th year in a row, Abbotsford Mission was named the most charitable region of Canada. The average annual donation to charity in my community was an astonishing $840 per person. Abbotsford is home to numerous charities and faith communities, including the Cyrus Centre, Life Recovery, Food for the Hungry and MCC, all of which support the poorest and most vulnerable among us. Recently, an Abbotsford man took generosity to a whole new level by offering to give the gift of life. Local hot dog vendor Andrew Scully White heard that one of his customers was very sick and desperately needed a new kidney. Scully bravely stepped forward and is in the process of donating one of his own kidneys to save the customer's life. A big thank you to all Canadians who sacrificially give of themselves and their resources to make our world a better place. The Honourable Member for Kitchener South, Hester. This week marks the 30th anniversary of International Development Week under the theme, Go for the Goals referring to the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I recently visited Tanzania, a Canadian-funded project uh, with Results Canada, where I saw aid investments improve children's health and well-being. Thanks to the investments made by the Government of Canada through Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, one mun municipality in Dar el Salaam was able to immunize 91% of children with life-saving vaccines against devastating disease like polio. Canada has been a leader in, in polio eradication through its support uh, to the Global Polio Era Eradication Initiative. And we've never been closer to finishing the job. Projects focusing on strengthening the health and well-being of countries like Tanzania through routine immunizations, adequate water and sanitation, and proper nutrition are essential. This year, I encourage all members in the House to go for the goals. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Vaudreuil-Soulanges. Mr. Speaker, Dr. Laurent Duvernay-Tardif has pulled off a new uh, feat by winning the Super Bowl. He won the Vincent Lombardi Trophy for the first time in 50 years, and he has become the first Quebecer in the National Football League to play and win a uh, Super Bowl. But that's not all, Mr. Speaker. He's from Saint Mont Saint-Hilaire in Quebec, and he was a med student at McGill. He played for the Redmen. He's the first active doctor to have played in and won a Super Bowl. Mr. Speaker, I speak on behalf of all members of this House and all Canadians and Quebecers when I say that we're proud of Dr. Duvernay Tardif and we offer all our congratulations to him and his family. The Honourable Member for Provence. Mr. Speaker, children need love and stability to thrive and become productive citizens. Tens of thousands of Canadian children are currently living in foster care, and our foster agencies across the country are overwhelmed by the sheer volume of kids in care. Some 30,000 children are currently eligible for adoption and desperately awaiting the love and stability of a forever family. Sadly, for too many Canadian children, this dream never becomes reality. Older children, those with disability, and Indigenous children are less likely to be adopted, many of them aging out of the system without ever realizing the dream, the love, the stability of a forever family. Mr. Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the thousands of Canadian families who open their hearts, their homes, and share their love as foster and adoptive parents. And I would ask my colleagues of all parties, let's work together to raise awareness of this important issue, find real solutions, and help Canadian kids find their forever home. The Honourable Member for Miramichi Grand Lake. I rise today to honour Sergeant John Forbes, a Second World War veteran who passed away last December. 
John joined the army at age 16 and was sent to England in 1940. He landed in Normandy shortly after D-Day and was wounded by landmine during the advance from Holland to Germany in 1945. Following five months in hospital, he was released and returned to civilian life. John continued his service by becoming a reserve soldier by, by helping other veterans in need. He was a strong advocate in schools and the community, and at the age of 96, John was still helping others and promoting commemorations. He has been recognized many times for his dedicated and long-term service, including the French Legion Honor, and John will receive the Minister's of uh, Veterans Affairs commemoration uh, posthumously. Let's never forget the freedom we are enjoying today in Canada. It's because of the sacrifice by people like John Forbes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Port neuf jacques cartier Mr. Speaker, this Quebecer is now, uh, was on the starting lineup of the team that went on to win football's greatest prize, Super Bowl 54. Laurent Duvernay-Tardif Duvernay pulled off an extraordinary feat. He's an inspiration to our young people. His determination, perseverance, self-discipline, and passion put him among football's elite. I'd suggest the Prime Minister might want to remember his name, Laurent Duver Duvernay-Tardif. It's important to discover and acknowledge these Quebecers Quebecers such as him. His parents were with him every step of the way throughout his studies. Young Canadians, both boys and girls, can be inspired by this athlete, believe in their own potential, and make their own dreams come true. In addition to being an outstanding athlete, this fluently bilingual francophone doctor is a wonderful showcase of Canadian talent. Congratulations, Laurent. You are a true champion. Before we continue, I'd like to remind the House that there are people making speeches, so if uh, people could be a bit quieter, that would help. West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Liberal government likes to pat themselves on their back for openness and transparency, but when you look a bit closer at the man behind the curtain, you'll see just how clearly their Orwellian plans are. Now, rather than fix the problems with the CRTC, in typical Liberal fashion, this government is planning on piling on more rules and taxes on the backs of the private sector, the creative industry as a whole, and, of course, the taxpayer. And then there is the issue of press freedom. Andrew Coyne says it best. If the government goes through with their plan, there won't be a syllable that is breathed or printed anywhere in the country that does not come under the Commission's supervision. The Heritage Minister says that media licensing will likely be proportionate, but as the case with everything with this government, it will likely be a massive failure. I want to remind the Minister of Heritage that Big Brother is just a TV show and not a blueprint for this government. The Honourable Member for Hamilton Centre. To rise on behalf of my caucus colleagues in the NDP in celebration of the black excellence and contribution to Canada of the African diaspora and her descendants. To those who blazed the trails from which we followed, I would like to personally thank the likes of the Honourable Lincoln Alexander, the Honourable Jean Augustine, Howard McCurdy, Rosemary Brown, and Selena Caesar Chavanez. Let it be recorded that Canadians of African descent are, in fact, all living histories, each an example of the resilience and perseverance of our ancestors and the present-day embodiment of freedom seekers. Let the record also show our deepest gratitude to those from all backgrounds who continue the proud abolitionist history in Canada to end racism of all of its pernicious forms. From the skin we are in by Desmond Cole, to policing black lives by Robin Maynard, and until we are free by Black Lives Matter Toronto, our histories continue to be written. But Mr. Speaker, the question remains, is Canada ready for it to be read? Whoa. The Honourable Member for Montcalm. Mr. Speaker, this is the 30th annual National Suicide Prevention Week. This year's theme, talking about suicide saves lives. The goal of this week is to mobilize the public to change the culture around suicide and to raise awareness among the public and politicians of the help that's out there. 
I'd like to salute the work of all mental health workers. Thanks to them, the suicide rate in Quebec is going down. But still, 12 out of 100,000 people still do the undoable, 75% of whom are men. 20 years ago, suicide was seen as a fact of life you couldn't do anything about. We now know it can be prevented. Each and every suicide is a failure of society. The first thing each of us should do is speak openly about it, without taboos, and above all, listen. Number four, Kildonan the St. Paul. Black History Month is a time to celebrate, recognize, and remember the significant contributions made by black Canadians to build our great country. From Hogan's Alley in Vancouver to Africville, north of Halifax, black Canadians have a rich culture and generations-long history and have preserved and persevered through adversity and discrimination to thrive in Canada. Our party is home to many trailblazers who have served our country with distinction, like Lincoln Alexander, Canada's first black member of parliament, cabinet minister, and lieutenant governor of Ontario. Yeah. Closer to home, the 2019 Manitoba provincial election saw three MLAs of black heritage elected to the legislature for the very first time, including my friend and former colleague, Audrey Gordon, MLA for Southdale. Their elections are points of pride for Manitoba's strong black Canadian communities. A special acknowledgement to my constituent, Devon Clunas, who rose through the ranks of the Winnipeg Police Service over his 29-year career to become Canada's first police chief of black heritage. My colleagues and I look forward to celebrating Black History Month across this country. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Hall Elmer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As you know, February is Black History Month. It's also an occasion for all Canadians to discover and explore the many lasting contributions of blacks to our great country. The more we dig into our history, the more we discover. History is fluid and that is fully dependent upon what we choose to see. For example, did you know that in 1800, Philemon Wright, the so-called founder of our national capital region, was accompanied by Oxford London, a free black man. As you can see, Mr. Speaker, black Canadians have made well-recognized contributions to our country, and their examples abound. And I would invite all Canadians, Mr. Speaker, all parliamentarians to explore the richness of our diversity and celebrate Black History Month. Happy Black History Month. Question oral. Oral questions. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Heritage has proposed new rules for the media and online broadcasters. He went so far as to say that the government would define which sources of information are trustworthy and they would license media companies. Now facing a public backlash, the minister is only creating more confusion. But can the prime minister confirm that these proposals will not see the light of day under his mandate? The right honorable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the house, we will always support a free and independent press. The report that we received proposed exempting uh, news media from licensing. I want to be clear. We will not impose licensing on press agencies. We will not regulate their content either. Our goal is to ensure that Canadi Canadians have access to credible, high quality news and we are currently studying the report's recommendations. Opposition. Mr. Speaker, George Orwell's 1984 was supposed to be a cautionary tale about the evils of big government, not an instruction manual for this Prime Minister. But it's no, it's no wonder that Canadians are suspicious about this. This is the same Prime Minister who has admiration for China's basic dictatorship. Yep. The same Prime Minister who heaped, who heaped praise on Fidel Castro, a man who was responsible for the deaths of millions. And of course, he put Jerry Diaz on a panel to decide which news organizations will get cash. Now, in today's uh, press conference, the, the minister actually said that media organizations. Your right, Honorable Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we believe in a strong, free, and independent Absolutely. press. Absolutely. The third-party report we received proposes to exempt news media from licensing requirements. I want to be unequivocal. We will not impose licensing requirements on news organizations, nor will we regulate news content. Our focus is on ensuring I just want to remind the honourable members it's one question at a time, so while somebody's giving an answer, we can't throw questions across and expect answers. Let's try to keep this as orderly as possible. The right honourable Prime Minister. As always, Mr. Speaker, our focus is on ensuring Canadians have access to diverse, high quality and credible news. We are currently studying the recommendations of this report. Uh, Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's understandable why they would want to control the news, because the news is getting increasingly bleak for this government's economic performance. Oh. Forecasts are consistently being downgraded, and this Prime Minister keeps moving the yardsticks on how to measure his own mismanagement. First, the promise was to have small temporary deficits, and when that didn't work out, then it was going to be that the debt-to-GDP ratio never changed. Now, his new justification is that his credit rating, the, the, the country's credit rating, is still okay. That's like saying that the credit card company keeps increasing the limit. When will the Prime Minister realize that this is a recipe for disaster? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The member opposite wants to talk about measurements. How about over a million new jobs created? Oh, yeah. How about close to a million Canadians lifted out of poverty? How about 300,000 plus ki kids lifted out of poverty? Wow. As wow. opposed to the stubborn years of low growth under the Harper Conservatives, we have invested in our communities, grown our economy, created opportunities, and a real and fair chance for Canadians to succeed. That's what this government has done. The Honourable uh, Leader of the Opposition. The facts are exactly the opposite. Under our government, we saw growth in the private sector. Under this government, we see growth in wasteful government spending. And we look at our partners around the world. Growth is higher than over half the G7 countries than it is here at home in Canada. The Parliamentary Budget Officer has confirmed that the billions that he booked in infrastructure spending didn't have a single bit of impact on the GDP. So when will this Prime Minister realize that a high-tax, wasteful spending agenda will hurt Canada's economy. The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives consistently try to twist the truth, but the reality is we lowered taxes for the middle class as the very first thing we did and raised taxes on the wealthiest 1%. We also move forward, as promised, as our first thing in this new mandate with lowering taxes even further for the middle class. The average Canadian family is $2,000 better off today wow. than they were wow. under Stephen Harper, and it's because we choose to invest in Canadians and invest in our future. Oh. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, real wage growth was up under the previous Conservative government. Wages are barely keeping pace with inflation. GDP growth is barely keeping a pace with population growth. Foreign investment is down, bankruptcies and insolvency is up. But it is good news if you are a well-connected Liberal insider, because we've now learned that MasterCard's senior lobbyist is a former Liberal advisor who made numerous contributions to the Liberal Party. Can the Prime Minister confirm that MasterCard's lobbyists and, her connection, and, and its connections with the Liberal Party help them get the $50 million grant from Canadian side? Prime Minister. Speaker, this investment is an investment in Canadians' welfare and Canadian jobs. It supports a new world-class cybersecurity centre in Vancouver that will create hundreds of good jobs and protect Canadians from cyber threats in an increasingly digital world. Now, just in September, someone said it is vital that the government adopt new policies and keep up technology to make sure that Canadians, their money and their personal information is protected. Who said that, Mr. Speaker? the Leader of the Opposition. Oh. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, the government has less than a month to either approve or reject the mega-polluting mega-project known as Tech Frontier. It's 260,000 barrels of oil a day, 4 million tons of greenhouse gases per year for 40 years. 
That's what's on the table, Mr. Speaker. The government had better get started on that tree planting, because their greenhouse gas reductions targets won't last long at this rate. The government has two choices, Mr. Speaker. The question is simple. What will it choose? Tech frontier or fighting climate change? Très honorable Premier ministre. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canadians elected us to protect the environment and to grow the economy, as well as to advance reconciliation and create good jobs. They also expect fair and comprehensive environmental assessments. The decision on this project will be made soon by uh, under the 2012 Environmental Assessment Act. We'll be looking at a range of factors. We'll be looking at the uh, factor of uh, having net zero emissions by 2050, as well as middle class jobs and economic growth, as well as protecting the environment. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, if the Prime Minister isn't just posing as an environmentalist, he should stop the rhetoric and start taking real action. He needs to show the courage of his convictions, Mr. Speaker. Rejecting Tech Frontier would be a good start, but approving it would be disastrous. Over its life cycle, Tech Frontier would produce at least 160 megatons of greenhouse gases in 40 years. That's more than twice what Quebec produces in a year. Will the government say no to this project? that harms Quebec, harms Canada, and harms the entire world. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I find it a bit ironic when the Bloc Québécois talks about action instead of rhetoric. On this side of the House, we are taking action. We're banning single-use plastics. We are putting a price on pollution across the country. We are protecting... Uh, record uh, terrestrial and marine areas to pr promote a better future. We're on target to reach our Paris targets, and we will continue to protect the environment while creating jobs. Those are the actions that we are taking on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. This government uh, brags about our role on the international stage, but they won't condemn, tr condemn Trump's new policies in the Middle East policies that will legitimize the illegal occupation of Palestinian territories. It will also create more tension and complicate a peaceful solution. Rather than calling out his plan, the Liberals say they want to study it. But there's nothing to study. This plan will not bring the two parties together, and it will not end the injustice that Palestinians are enduring. When will the government call out Donald Trump's policy? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Canada's policy on the Middle East is long-standing and very clear. We uh, favor a two-state solution that is di negotiated directly by the two parties involved. We need a safe and democratic Israel, working together with a safe and democratic Palestinian state. We have always moved toward that objective with our partners around the world. For Windsor West. Time and time again, we learn more about this Liberal government's will to bend over backwards for large corporations instead of working for Canadians. Mm -hmm. The U.S. has leveled Volkswagen $20 billion in fines for breaking the law, whereas in Canada, this government is bragging about a $2.5 million fine. This is after Export Development Canada loaned Volkswagen $525 million to build vehicles in other countries while carrying out their environmental crimes. What an embarrassment. Why do lobbyists and insiders always win with this Prime Minister's government? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, this investigation and all related prosecution matters, and the judge's approval of the penalty are made independently of ministers' offices. The company paid an unprecedented fine in Canada as a result of the investigation. Indeed, it was 23 times greater than the highest federal environmental fine ever imposed. That the Public Prosecution Service determines what, determines what charges can be sustained, and it has sole jurisdiction to pursue a prosecution. Funds from the fine will go towards projects to protect our environment. Absolutely. Honourable Member for Edmonton Riverbend. Mr. Speaker, the World Health Organization has called the coronavirus a global health emergency. 
Other countries are taking proactive measures by declaring a public health emergency. Other countries are cancelling all flights in and out of China. The United States said they're implementing these measures to increase their abilities to detect and contain the coronavirus. Why hasn't Canada done the same? The World Health Minister. Much, Mr. Speaker, and the situation uh, around coronavirus has indeed been declared a world health public health emergency. Here in Canada, we have very different processes in place than in the United States. For example, we don't need to call a public health emergency here because we already have the structures, the systems, and the authorities to spend appropriate dollars necessary to respond, treat, and maintain our public health systems. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable <laughs> Member for Richmond, Athabasca. Mr. Speaker, there are now four confirmed cases of coronavirus in Canada. We've learned that the Canadians in China who will be... ...and disappointment as the flight that they were told that would bring Canadians home from China has yet to take off. The UK, the US, EU countries, Japan and South Korea have all been successful in evacuating their citizens affected by the coronavirus from yep. China. What is the holdup? Is the delay in evacuation due to the disastrous state of Canada-China relations? When will this government be able to set a date for the flight to get Canadian citizens from China home? Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, to answer the question of my colleague, the answer is not at all, Mr. Speaker. Once you have an emergency, the first thing you need to do is to assess the needs. This is what we did. The second thing we did, Mr. Speaker, was to charter a plane. This is what we did. And what we're working on, Mr. Speaker, now is with respect to authorization and organizing the ground logistics, Mr. Speaker. We will be there for Canadians in Iran who want to be repatriated. And I will inform Canadians at every step of the way of what this government is doing for them. The Honourable Member for Belchasse, Les Etchemins Lévis. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Heritage is trying to put the toothpaste back in the toothpaste tube. But of course, that doesn't work. After four years of inaction, now the Liberals want to start policing journalists. First, they tried to tempt them with a $600 million subsidy. That didn't work. Now the Minister uh, is talking about licensing newsrooms. It's a move worthy of Big Brother, Mr. Speaker. When will, when will the minister put an end to these undemocratic maneuvers and start taking care of the cultural sector? The Honourable Minister of Heritage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government will always support a strong, free and independent press. My colleague, the member for Belle Chasse et Chemin-Lévis, said last week that the report was interesting and that he welcomed it. Unlike the Conservatives, we will be working not only to not to define our policies in Hollywood, but here in Canada for Canadians and Quebecers. Thank you. For Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, Canadians have seen a jaw-dropping erosion of rights under this Liberal government. For example, Bill C-76, which rigged election rules in the Liberals' favour, and the $600 million selected bailout of selected struggling newspapers. Now, Mr. Speaker, these Liberals have embraced a shocking recommendation to license media companies. Wow. An Orwellian tool used by ruthless authoritarian governments. Mr. Speaker, are the Liberals so desperate to cling to power they would emulate dystopian societies in Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran? The Honourable Minister for Canadian Heritage. Mr. Speaker, the report done by an independent body that we received last week specifically said that news media should be exempted for license requirements. Let me be clear on our intentions. Our government will not plan to impose licensing requirements on news organizations. We will nor will I'm having a hard time hearing the Honourable Minister. Uh, I just want everyone to maybe just take a deep breath. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Nor will we regulate news content. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. Both the Minister and the Prime Minister have said that certain news media outlets will be exempt from their licenses, which means that there are licenses to be right. exempt mm. from. Exactly. There should be no restrictions on freedom of speech or freedom of the press. And on this side of the House, we will protect Canadians' hard-won 
on freedom. Right Why won't this super woke government do the same? Right here, here, here. The Honorable Minister. Merci, Monsieur le Président. No. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government will always support a strong, free, and independent press. I've said it before, but I'll repeat. The report from the independent panel that we received says that news media would be exempted from licensing. I want to be clear as to our intentions. Our government will not impose licensing requirements on press agencies, nor will we determine their content. The Honourable Member for Avignon, La Métis, Matan Matapédia. Mr. Speaker, the oil sands project to tech frontier will produce a minimum of 4 million tons of greenhouse gases every year for 40 years. That's equivalent to putting a million new cars on our roads, or 4 million road trips between Montreal and Vancouver. And yet, during the election, the Prime Minister promised that Canada would be carbon neutral by 2050. Given that Tech Frontier will continue polluting until at least 2067, will the government show some consistency and say no to Tech Frontier? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Monsieur le Président. Uh, le gouvernement... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government will be factoring in a number of considerations when it makes a decision on this project. Notably, we will be factoring in our goal of being carbon neutral by 2050, uh, advancing reconciliation, creating good jobs, and promoting economic growth. This is a major project, and our government is studying it with great attention. And we will make a decision under the Environmental Assessment Act before the end of February. Tech Frontier is potentially disastrous, and the government claims it can offset those oil sands emissions by planting two billion trees. Well, Mr. Speaker, let's do some math. If two million trees reduce greenhouse gas, or rather reduce greenhouse gases by 30 megatons over 10 years, Tech Frontier alone would increase greenhouse gas emissions by 40 megatons in the same period. And that doesn't include the rest of the oil industry. It also doesn't include Trans Mountain. So will the government stop taking us for fools and reject Tech Frontier? The Honorable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I said, there is a process. Uh, we are currently working very hard to issue a decision before the end of February. But of course, the environmental effects are very important in our consideration. The Honorable Member for Repentigny. Well, since I'm not getting a different answer, I'll try the Minister of Heritage. I very much agree with what he said on the talk show Tout le monde en parle two weeks ago. He said that all ministers are responsible for climate change. And I totally agree. His cabinet is preparing to rule on the Tech Frontier project. It represents over 160 megatons of greenhouse gas emissions for its life cycle. Will the minister ask his colleagues to reject Tech Frontier? The Honorable Minister. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As my colleagues said, all ministers and all departments are responsible of factoring in climate change. That's something that's very important for Canadians, and particularly young Canadians. This is something that we need to work on, and we need to think about when we're making decisions for any project, including this one. The Honourable Member for Fort McMurray Cold Lake. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the project being proposed by Tech Resources would create 9,500 jobs for Canadians and generate tens of billions of dollars for our economy. While the Liberals are eager to meet with foreign-funded environmental activists, they haven't yet had meaningful consultations with stakeholders in the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo. Will the Prime Minister agree to meet with the municipality of Wood Buffalo and their key stakeholders regarding the pending decision on the Frontier Project? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. President. This government was elected on a platform to ensure that we had appropriate processes in place, that we followed those processes. That This is an environmental assessment process. We're following the process to make a decision before the end of February. During that process, extensive consultations were undertaken by the Impact Assessment Agency under the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. The Cabinet will now need to weigh all of the various considerations and look at all of the environmental impacts in order to make a decision. 
The Honourable Member for Lakelands. Well, Mr. Speaker, in July, after eight years of an evidence-based review, experts did recommend approval of the Tech Frontier Mine. It checks every box, world-class environmental practices, every local Indigenous community, and every local municipality support it. Each Alberta oil sands job creates 3.2 jobs in the rest of Canada, but the Liberals are holding hostage 10,000 much-needed jobs in Alberta after 200,000 losses they're already under them. No wonder Alberta says this decision is a national unity issue. That's right. So when will the Liberals right. approve yeah. Tech Frontier? That's right. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, uh, Mr. P President, Mr. Speaker. Um, this is, a, this is a project like any other project that goes through a process. It is governed under the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. Right. We, are, we are mandated to review the environmental impacts of all of those projects. The, project, the, the process is proceeding as it is intended to do so. Correct. The honourable member should actually read the law. This is entirely within the, the process. Here, and we here. will be making Good a decision point. by the end of February. Here, here. The honourable member for Louis Saint Laurent. Yes, Mr. Speaker, Tech Frontier is a good project for all Canadians from coast to coast to coast. It represents nearly 10,000 jobs and $20 billion in investments in the Canadian economy. And everything has been done properly. All of the procedures and rules are followed. The 14 First Nations who are di directly affected by the project approve it. Provincial and federal oversight bodies all gave their approval. So everything is set. All we're waiting for is the federal government's approval. Why is the Liberal government once again hindering proper resource development in Canada? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I said, the government will be factoring in a number of considerations before it makes a decision on this project. Notably, we will be looking at our uh, target of being carbon neutral by 2050 our goal to advance reconciliation and to create good jobs. This is a major project, and our government is studying it with great attention. We will make a decision under the Environmental Assessment Act before the end of Fev February. Member for North Island, Powell River. Mr. Speaker, this House unanimously passed an NDP motion to help veterans by automatically carrying forward unspent funds to the following year. This didn't happen. Last year alone, this government shortchanged veterans by $381 million. Unreal. While the department is facing staggering backlogs of disability claims and failing on more than half of their service standards, veterans are struggling to get their basic needs met. Why is this government breaking promises to our veterans? Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate my Honourable Colleague's question, and I know she cares. The fact is, our program, our benefits are demand-driven. This means that the money is always there for veterans. When we're not leaving any money unspent, we are making sure that the money is always available. In Veterans Affairs, our job is to improve our benefits and care for our veterans. I can assure my honourable colleague that's what we're doing and that's what we will continue to do. The member for North Island, Powell River. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, over $100 million this year alone was left on the table. And when we know veterans are struggling every day to get some of their key supports met, we know that we have to see this government do better. So I want to repeat again, there was a unanimous motion where we all agreed across every party in this House to make sure that veterans that we know are on wait list, waiting for their immediate services that they need now, we know that the service standards are not even close to meeting their targets, and we know that workers are getting burnt out every single day. Why is this money continuing to be left on the table? The Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, my honourable colleague truly cares, but in fact, we have hired quite a number of, of case workers. In fact, the previous government had fired most of them. We have now over 500 case workers. But uh, as I indicated, Mr. Speaker, uh, our programs are demand uh, driven. And the money. I'm having a I'm having a hard time hearing the answer, and I'm about 20 feet away from the honourable member. I'm sure the folks down at the other end are having a hard time. So I'm just going to ask the honourable members to maybe keep it down and whisper to each other. I'm sure as we get older, we have a hard time hearing, and they're shouting so that the person next to them can hear. Believe me, it's not that bad. The honourable minister. 
Mr. Speaker, as I indicated, we had a lot of work to do when we formed government, and along with that, we invested $10 billion in veterans' benefits. As I said before, we have and will continue to make sure that our veterans in this country are cared for. The Honourable Member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Mr. Speaker, plastic pollution is a growing problem in our communities. Plastic waste ends up in our landfills, litters our parks and beaches, and pollutes our rivers, lakes, and oceans. Canadians across the country, including the residents of Mississauga Lakeshore, have made it clear that they want action. Could the Minister of Environment and Climate Change please update this House on what our government's doing to tackle plastic pollution? Question. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Mississauga Lakeshore for his question and his advocacy on this issue. Last week, our government released a robust science assessment of plastic pollution, which confirms that plastic pollution is harming our environment. In the coming weeks, we will announce next steps under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. This will include steps towards a ban on harmful single-use plastics in 2021 and broader strategies to manage the life cycle of plastics. By plas uh, tackling plastic pollution, we can seize on the economic opportunity of the circular economy and protect our environment. Thank you. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Cypress Hills, Grasslands. Mr. Speaker, farmers are trying to recover from last year's devastating harvest, but the carbon tax is only making it harder. Today, the Agricultural Producers Association of Saskatchewan released some stunning numbers. They predict that our farmers will lose on average 12% of their total net income because of the carbon tax. For an average Saskatchewan grain farm, that means losing up to $15,000 in revenue. The Liberals' farm-killing carbon tax threatens the livelihood of Canadian farm families. Why are the Liberals so intent on bankrupting farmers with their carbon tax? Here, here, here. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the uh, agricultural producers of Saskatchewan for providing me with additional information. We recognize that 2019 has been a very difficult year for them, for all the farmers all across Canada. It's been challenging because of trade disruption, because of climate as well. And I'm always open to listen to more information. I'm working hard with my provincial colleagues as well as with the industry to find optimal solution, very practical solution to support our farmers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Foothill. It has been a trying because the Liberal policies are crushing Canadian agriculture. Right. The previous Liberal Agriculture That's Minister right. said farmers were fully supportive of the carbon tax. <laughs> the current Liberal Agriculture Minister doesn't seem to really care. She's admitted she's not even collecting data on the carbon tax That's and right. how it impacts Canadian farmers. The Liberal carbon tax is costing Canadian farmers tens of thousands of dollars. The APAS president, Todd Lewis, says it's comparable to having 12% of your paycheck just disappear. Why is the Liberal Agriculture Minister just standing idly by while the carbon tax bankrupts Canadian farm families? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, I want to thank the agricultural producers of Saskatchewan for sharing this information with me, which I received today. Mr. Speaker, we stand by our farmers. We know that 2019 has been a difficult year. We have made important uh, work on improving our business risk management tools, and we are working as well with our provincial colleagues and with the industry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. Mr. Speaker, Marilyn Levesque was murdered by a man who was known for his violence against women. Not only was he convicted for murdering his wife, but he also had been banned from work visiting Ms. Levesque's place of work due to his history of violence. What's truly shocking is that the Parole Board of Canada endorsed a society reinsertion strategy that allowed him to meet women in order to address his sexual needs. Will the minister fire the parole officer who put this man's sexual needs over the safety of women in his community? Yeah. Minister for Public Safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as, as we have said, the tragic murder of Ms. Levesque should never have occurred. And that's exactly why we've ordered a, a thorough investigation with external advisors to take place and to determine all of the circumstances that gave rise to this tragedy. The investigation will be transparent, the findings will be shared with the public, and our first priority will always be to keep Canadians safe. We will work tirelessly to prevent similar tragedies from ever occurring again. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, we don't need to investigate long to see that it says in black and white that parole board members gave this person the right to, to seek out the services of an escort. I asked the Prime Minister to show the board member the officer at the door. What's he waiting for? Thank you very much. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, 
Um, last De December or last September, the Pearl Board of Canada explicitly opposed letting this particular accused visit massage parlors while on day parole, and that's why it's necessary to conduct a thorough investigation to examine whether Correction Services Canada and Pearl Board of Canada followed the proper protocols and what changes may be appropriate to prevent this from occurring again. Mr. Speaker, we'll get the facts and then we will hold individuals and organizations to account. The Honourable Member for Santia saint bagot Mr. Speaker, the Bloc Québécois has spoken a great deal about our concerns on the abandoning of aluminum, Quebec aluminum, under CASMA. Now, we've clearly talked about jobs and economic spin-offs, but we're also concerned because Quebec aluminum is an opportunity for the world to seize when it comes to climate change. Quebec aluminum is the greenest in the world. It runs a risk of being replaced on the North American market by the dirtiest aluminum in the world. How can the government accept jeopardizing our aluminum for the benefit of China? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we didn't accept that, and I must underscore once again that the new NAFTA agreement is a good agreement for Canada and for Quebec and for our aluminum sector. Today, we have no guarantees for aluminum when it comes to uh, uh, cars being manufactured in North America under the new NAFTA agreement, 70 percent of aluminum used will come from North America. 70 percent is better than zero. The Honourable Member for Santia saint bagot Mr. Speaker, abandoning Quebec aluminum under CASMA will stop six investment projects in Quebec at a time when we're on the cusp of producing the first carbon-neutral aluminum in the world, a real breakthrough, Mr. Speaker. And for the benefit of China, which produces 90 percent of its aluminum using coal and emits eight times as much greenhouse gas as Quebec does. They're penalizing the top of the class to reward the worst. Why is the government depriving Quebec of a golden business opportunity in the light of climate change? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as regards Quebec and the new NAFTA agreement, allow me to quote the Premier of Quebec. Mr. Legault, he said, I think the Blanc Québécois must defend the interests of Quebecers. It's in the interest of Quebecers for this agreement to be applied and adopted. I think that it's the duty of all Quebec members of Parliament to defend the interests of Quebec, and to do so, they must ratify the new NAFTA agreement, which is in the interest of Quebec and the rest of Canada as well. Brent. Mr. Speaker. In 2019, the Liberals left $105 million meant for veterans unspent. This, despite the Prime Minister promising he wouldn't do so if elected, and after telling Canadian veterans they were asking more than the government could give. How much of this $105 million would have been given to veterans if they weren't trapped in the benefits backlog boondoggle of this government's making. The Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate my honourable colleague's question, but I wish the member for Brentford Brent had that feeling when, was, when he was in power, when his government was in power. In fact, when they're in power, they fired a thousand employees and really cut and hurt the Department of Veterans Affairs, Mr. Speaker. Our government invested $10 billion in the Department of Veterans Affairs and also on, demand, on, on benefits that are demand driven. And we always make sure, Mr. Speaker, that the funding is there to every veteran that qualified to receive their benefit. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for North Okanagan, Shuswa. Canadian lobster and stoke crab fishermen are being blindsided by regulations forced upon by the U.S. If we had a U.S. full-time U.S. ambassador, they might be able to intervene in the U.S., but one has not been appointed. Is the fisheries minister going to continue the practice of regulating lobster and snow crab fisheries under duress from the U.S., or will she work with stakeholders and the U.S. to come up with regulations that will work for all? 
The Honourable Minister for Fisheries and Oceans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we recognize the importance of seafood exports and across this country. That's why we're working with our harvesters, with uh, with communities, with our, our partners in the U.S. to address these issues. We will continue to do that as we go forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Barrie Innisfil. Violence is escalating and mayors are pleading for help. Mayor John Tory said recently sentences must fit the extreme gravity of gun crimes, and right now they often don't. Even Toronto Police Chief Mark Saunders said his community is deflated and frontline officers are frustrated with repeat gun offenders being granted bail. The mayors have also called for decisive action on guns coming across the Canada-U.S. border. Why can't the Liberals see that their soft-on-crime approach is doing the opposite of what leaders are calling for and work on solving the real causes of gun violence in Canada? Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, we've been very clear that, that across the country we have heard a strong consensus to strengthen gun control laws and to make investments in policing and in our communities to reduce gun violence. Based on the, on the, the member opposite's question, Mr. Speaker, I'm looking forward to his support for the initiatives that we will bring forward to give the police new tools, new, new authorities, and new resources to deal with the issue of guns coming across our borders, being diverted from, from legitimate owners, and being stolen. Mr. Speaker, we'll take the steps necessary to keep our community safe. Yeah, yeah. Member for Vimy. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, our aluminum producers' know-how, talent, and expertise are the envy of the world. They play a critical role in our economy in Quebec and across the country. Can the minister update Canadians on our government's work to ensure a cleaner and more sustainable future for the aluminum sector in Canada and to guarantee good jobs for the middle class in this important sector? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for Vimy for her question. Our government has always been there for Quebec aluminum workers. Since 2018, we have invested in our smelters, supporting some 2,500 good jobs in Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean, Deschambault, and cette île. This will help to secure good long-term jobs in an innovative and more sustainable industry. For Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. Mr. Speaker, the government revealed that 38 departments and agencies mishandled sensitive information more than 5,000 times last year. Yikes. Clearly, this isn't a one-off. This is a pattern across this Liberal government. Mismanaged and misplaced, it's clear these Liberals don't care about the privacy of Canadians. When will this Prime Minister hold his ministers to account and demand that they protect the privacy of Canadians? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to safeguarding sensitive government information and maintaining the highest standards of document security as prescribed in our policies. Each employee receives proper training on this, and minimum safeguards for protected and classified uh, documents are outlined in the Directive on Security Management. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to mo uh, monitor and ensure that the privacy of Canadians are protected. The Honourable Member for Halliburton, Quartha Lakes, Brock. Mr. Speaker, last year this government had over 5,000 security breaches related to classified documents. That's 20 for every day worked. No one fired, no one security clearance revoked. And if that wasn't bad enough, Mr. Speaker, one ministry felt it was above the will of Canadians. Wow. It, in a front of Parliament, Speaker, Global Affairs didn't even bother to disclose their breaches. So much for open and accountable Parliament. Will the Prime Minister protect democracy now and demand that Global Affairs release their breaches? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. President, come to Mr. Speaker, as I just said, privacy of Canadian data is very important for our government. Our government is determined to protect private information and government information as well. All employees receive training on security measures, Mr. Speaker, and clearly we will continue to do 
work in this area. Terry McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, trade officials confirmed at committee that this government has a policy of promoting the active involvement of Canadian companies in China's Belt and Road Initiative. This expansionist foreign policy initiative is infamous for ensnaring developing countries into a debt trap, leaving them forever indebted to Beijing. Can the minister confirm that if, in fact, it is the Liberals' policy to promote the active participation of Canadian businesses in China's Belt and Road Initiative? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Canada has a deep and long-standing relationship with China based on mutual economic prosperity, strengthened by our people-to-people -people ties. These ties are rooted in tradition, history, and mutual respect. Since the arrest of Michael Korvig and Michael Spaver, our government has made it our absolute priority to secure their immediate release, and we remain focused on that goal. Our trade policy will always be motivated by what is in the interests of Canadians. The Honourable Member for Bourassa. So speaker. Saturday was the first day of Black Historic Month 2020, and I look forward to participate in events that celebrate and honor the legacy of Black Canadians in Canada. Le thème. Merci. Le thème. The theme for this year, Canadians of African descent going forward guided by the past. It's important to learn about the role of Black Canadians. I was on efforts our government has taken to invest in black communities. The Honourable Minister of Diversity. I would like to thank my colleague for Barassa for his leadership and for this opportunity to talk about what the government has done on behalf of black Canadians. An international decade for people of African descent invested $9 million to enhance support for black Canadian youth. 10 million for culturally focused mental health programs, 25 million to build capacity in black Canadian communities, 45 million for the anti-racism strategy and the anti-racism secretariat. Mr. Speaker, I encourage all Canadians to take part in Black History Month and to learn the rich history of black Canadians. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Mr. Speaker, this government's record on the treatment of First Nations children is getting worse by the day. We learned that this government has actually spent not five, but over nine million dollars on legal fees to fight First Nations children in courts. This is shameful for a government that was found guilty for willfully and recklessly discriminating against First Nations children on reserve. Mr. Speaker, what price is this Prime Minister willing to spend on lawyers to continue violating the human rights of First Nations children? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member opposite for this question because it underscores a very important point. The historic tragedy that has faced First Nations kids in this country and the discrimination that they've endured. That is discrimination that we are committed to co correct. With respect to the legal cost issue she has raised, we are working very closely with the legal officials involved and lawyers on both sides. There are certain matters that are co covered by solicitor cl client privilege that cannot be disclosed, but we are working carefully with the lawyers to ensure that their legal fees are paid and that justice is rendered for these children. Merci. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is the Honourable Prime Minister. The B.C. salmon season of 2019 was a complete disaster. It constitutes an emergency situation for many Indigenous peoples for whom salmon is staple food of deep cultural and spiritual significance. For the fishermen, the tendermen, the shore workers, it's an economic disaster. These groups wrote and asked the government before the election for emergency salmon relief. The United Fishermen and Allied Workers Union, the, the Native Brotherhood of British Columbia, still have had no answer. When will salmon relief come for these communities? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I thank the member from Saanich Gulf Islands. We are committed to protecting wild Pacific salmon stocks. Many runs are in steep decline and we sympathize with First Nations workers and their families who indeed have a difficult year. The ministers are working with Indigenous communities and stakeholders to ensure that salmon stocks are protected. We've invested over $142 million to fund projects supporting research, conservation and innovation for the fishing industry on the West Coast. 
And that's all for today. C'est tout pour aujourd'hui. We have a point of order. The Honourable Member for Edmonton West. Rising out of question period, I'd like to uh, comment on the Minister of Veterans Affairs' comments about uh, cuts in the previous government. With the House's uh, permission, I'd like to table a report from Library Parliament showing that the Liberal government actually slashed 14% of full-time equivalents and 